Nordic Rebels Season 3, Skills for the Future. Um, when was the last time you actually checked you know, these lists telling you what kind of skills you need for the future? So you need creativity, analytical thinking, interdisciplinary knowledge, emotional intelligence, leadership skills, technology skills, skill skills, the lists, they just go on. But is it really about like ticking the boxes or establishing something long term, something more positive or something actually that changes in your body? That's what season three is going to be all about. So enjoy First the ride. My name is Rama Garawa. I'm the director of the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design at the Royal College of Art in London. I'm a designer, a design activist, a researcher, but most of all, I'm a human being. So today we're going to have a difficult conversation. Uh, we're going to talk about, well, first, what happens when you get a difficult brief. Mm. Yeah. And then all the dark sides of innovation, the things that people don't talk about. Sure. Yeah. So we are going to the dark side. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> so I think one of the biggest challenges with design and innovation is that people often glorify it we talk about the mm. shiny things but sometimes we mask over like yeah. the difficult conversations and that's something that we hope our students would understand um, and first maybe you can start with perhaps the most difficult brief or the most heart-wrenching brief you've ever dealt with sure could I start with difficult and then do heart-wrenching sure so the most difficult brief it's when it channels people into a, a single type of solution mm -hmm. and this is one that I see quite often which is let's design an app to solve dementia mm. to solve food shortage to solve gender inequality and then we will create a community around that app and then we'll sell the app to that community so it's what I call the app trap mm. and it's the kind of disunity of community because one of the darker sides of design is communities are full of petty tyrannies. Communities are fraught with challenges for designers, uh, for the community, and you need to approach communities in different ways. So I think that's the, my answer for the first one is any brief that just focuses you on that aspect of digital design apps. Um, quite often we say to students and designers, you can design anything, but not an app. And it absolutely challenges the creativity. Promotes creativity, actually. The most heart-wrenching brief we have ever done um, was dealing with suicide. So this was working in a live site, mm. which is the city of Derry, London Derry, in Ireland, Northern Ireland. And in a city of 100,000 people, there have been 1,700 recorded attempts 
um, on the River Foyle. We had a team that's been out there for three years, and that has been an absolutely heart-rending experience. When I went out there, and I actually went on the search and rescue boat, they simulated a response situation. Mm -hmm. And when we finished that, the search and rescue team started talking about their experiences. That gave rise to some very, very powerful emotions, and actually we were all in tears on the river. So when I think of a lot of design celebrates life, it's about enabling life, it's about creating life, it's about life. When you look at the ending of a life in one of the most sad, critical ways, when someone is in that level of crisis, that life becomes less appealing than ending life, that for me was one of the most heart-rending briefs. So what was your team's take on <coughs> dealing with this kind of mental health challenges? Like, how, did, how did it yeah. come to be in the first place? Did it approach you? So it started off as a public health, mental health mm -hmm. uh, issue. Okay. It very quickly became about the community, about the different factions in the community. Mm. It became about the families. Um, you know, when I was out there, I was only there for two or three days, but almost every single person I met had a story about someone or even a relative. Um, and that can take some getting used to. Mm. I mean, it's, it's not a topic we often talk about. Um, I was in a restaurant and this a uh, girl came up and she was talking to the group and when she said, oh, are you the people that are working, you, you know, on the bridge, which is where one of our design interventions are. Mm. And I said, yes. And she grabbed my hand and said, please, please, can you do something? Because I've lost my father, my brother first, and then my father um, on the bridge. <clears throat> so that, that kind of, that kind of, drive I think really helped our team through some very difficult experiences and I'm talking about human experiences not design experiences yeah. sometimes the two are linked um, uh, well they are linked humans are designers designers um, are humans so the team the team I think had to shift from a kind of design attitude a design for mental health attitude into one that was just deeply ingrained in community, mm -hmm. culture, and critical situations. Mm -hmm. And how, do your, how does your team respond in these kinds of situations? Like, I mean, it, it must feel quite daunting to be out there. And, being vulnerable with the people you're designing for, right? Yeah. To be, to be a designer means to give of yourself. It doesn't mean to give away yourself, but you have to give a little bit of yourself. One of the wonderful things for me and mm. for the team has been that your perspectives change. Mm. You know, when you go out and do this work, when you talk to real people, deal with real situations, your perceptives and your preconceptions change. So... We often say that the, the biggest attribute you need as a designer is an open heart. So when you have an open heart, then you are actually able to deal with situations in a way that is appropriate, that is dignity, that is equitable, because at the end of the day, design is about human conversation. Really interesting. Innovation is not an easy word. It's not an easy word for me to say because it's been so overused. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I went went to speak at a school mm -hmm. and it's a 600 year old school mm. and the headmistress stood up and said, we're about tradition, achievement and innovation. And looking around, you know, you sort of feel they hadn't really innovated for the last 500 years. But innovation mm. implies um, 
something that is around the deployment of creativity. So if creativity is about generating new ideas, mm -hmm. you know, innovation is about taking that, that creativity and putting it into a marketplace, deploying it. When we teach innovation, talk about innovation, um, the only way of dealing with some of the critical areas that you talked about, you know, AI, the turmoil of, you know, business 4.0, doing more with less, is to bring it back to the human experience. So we just did a project with artificial intelligence and mobility, looking at driverless vehicles. We talked to truck drivers mm -hmm. who, of course, you know, feel that they may be first on the chopping block for losing their jobs. So we started talking to them and we quickly realized that goods and services will need a steward. So you may not be a driver, you may be a steward of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And then what else could you be doing? Could you be reading a book? Could you be searching for cancerous cells on a, um, you know, on scans? Because, you know, if you think that when you have a scan in the hospital, it'll take between five to nine weeks for you to get the results. And most of that is being in a queue, waiting for someone to look at your scan. So what if you merge citizen science, another emerging area with truck drivers potentially not being drivers? How does that work? So I think that's where the human experience can kind of connect people. We're talking about a future where we are perhaps merging industries. It sounds like something that your team also looks at a bit, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's not quite merging, it's connecting. Mm -hmm. And it's also looking at parallel industries and what you could learn from them. What if you flip things on the head? Yeah. And we learned from Formula One. Because a Formula One car is not dissimilar in size to a hospital bed. Hmm. And, you know, do you, do you know the record number of seconds it takes to change four wheels on a, on a Formula One car? Just under two seconds. Really? Um, when we looked at them, we realised every team at the corner of the vehicle gets their own piece of equipment. In a hospital, the, the team at the head of the bed, the middle of the bed and the foot of the bed have to fight over one piece of equipment. So we designed one trolley that split into three, inspired by Formula One. So the paralleling of industries is really important. And one more thing, you know, talking of the dark side of innovation, innovation is difficult. You know, <laughs> innovation um, being difficult, you know, I quote a, a, a great philosopher um, from this century called Denzel Washington, mm -hmm. who said in one of his movies, you pray for the rain, you've got to deal with mud too. And that for me adequately describes innovation. It's not always rain, it's not always cleansing water, you've got to deal with mud. Mm -hmm. And how do you suggest to students who are perhaps new to innovation, what is the first thing they need to consider when sure. going with this? Well, if you're new to innovation, you probably haven't been a human being because you should be, you should be, you would have been creating, innovating as a child. Mm -hmm. And it's to tap into that level of um, empathy that you have within you because empathy will lead to creativity. You know, if you empathize with a situation or a person or with yourself, it will drive you towards more creative solutions. So... If I sat down and said, be creative, that's really difficult. If I said, here's a situation, let's look at migrant workers in the Middle East or water shortages um, in sub-Saharan Africa, and these are the situations and these are the story, these are the people, your creative juices start flowing. Mm. So empathy first, creativity second. <laughs> When you think about innovation, it's this word that everyone uses, but often it can lead to desperation, which is another word. At the Helen Hamlin Center for Design, we work with people with something called inclusive design. 
And that, I feel, takes innovation from a mode of desperation into one of aspiration. And that shift is incredibly important because when you tap into people's aspirations, going beyond functional need, that's where the magic happens. That's where as designers you can fully create, you can fully feel. And you create something that is more celebratory of life. I think that the centre, which has been going for 30 years, has really just adhered to that principle. And if I was to sum up what we did in one sentence, it would be designed to improve life. Everything around us is designed. It's designed by people, for people, with people, because of people. The most powerful thing you have as a designer is not your own creative output. It's the input that you have, the input that you give yourself. What do you feed yourself? Who do you talk to? What do you look at and where do you, where do you draw inspiration from? And when you look at everything around us, it's been through a design decision. Has it been a good one? Has it been a bad one? So innovation for me is actually getting the problem right, getting the situation right. Should we be designing a chair or should it be a ladder? Should we be designing a bridge or should we be designing a hovercraft? It's easier to go from the specific to the general. So working with a specific group of people will allow you to solve general challenges and even social and global issues. And you will address some of the big social issues of our time automatically.